Okay, starting with chapter six today from the Chocolate Touch. Remember, he was just um, <clears throat> finishing his math test. When the others had been excused to go out for mid-morning play, John had to go and stand by Mrs. Plimsoll's desk. John, Mrs. Plimsoll said, you mustn't make silly stories to excuse your failures. I must have the truth. What did you do with your pencil? This is it, said John, showing Mrs. Plimsoll the pointed stick of chocolate. Really, it is. It's changed. What do you mean it's changed, Mrs. Plimsoll demanded. That's my pencil, John tried to explain. Only, it isn't the same anymore. Nothing stays the same today if I put it into my mouth. The same thing happened when I chewed my gloves. They were chocolate, too. John, said Mrs. Plimsoll, slow, Mrs. Plimsoll slowly. Do you feel all right? Yes, thank you, John said. I feel all right, except he added, I'm getting so thirsty. The water from the water fountain <clears throat> turned to chocolate, and so did the water upstairs. I would like a drink of cold water. Yes, John, Mrs. Plimsoll said. She suddenly looked pale. <clears throat> You run out and play with the others. I'm going to have a talk with the nurse. And John, Mrs. Plimsoll said, as she started toward the classroom door, here's another pencil. Be a good boy and try not to lose it. I'm afraid I'll have to keep this piece of chocolate until school's out. You know we don't allow anyone to eat candy in class. Mrs. Plimsoll put the slightly chewed chocolate pencil in her desk drawer, and John went out to look for Susan. He found her skipping rope with two girls in his class. John usually scorned skipping rope. He preferred hide-and-seek, tag, FBI and spies, kick the can, or any other good, exciting game. Jumping up and down in one place just to avoid being hit by a rope seemed silly to him. But he was sorry for having spoiled Susan's silver dollar, and he was willing to make a sacrifice. Susan, he said. Susan continued to bounce on one foot as her two friends swung the rope over and under, over and under, over and under her. She didn't seem to notice John. I'll skip with you, he offered. Susan stopped, and the rope was caught by her shins. Let's try doubles, doubles backwards, she said, but not to John. She ignored John. You go first, Betty. Ellen, you'll go second. I'll go last. The one who does it the most times gets the first slice of my birthday cake. Susan looked at John, raised her eyebrows, shut her eyes, and stuck out the tip of her pink tongue. Then she turned back to the girls and smiled. Ellen whispered in Betty's ear, and Betty whispered in Susan's ear. Then all three of them looked at John and <clears throat> at each other again and burst out laughing. Oh, Susan, John protested. I didn't mean to do it. The trouble is, there's something magic about me today. Everything I put into my mouth turns to chocolate. The girls giggled. You wouldn't like it, said John, who was beginning to feel sorrier for himself than he had ever felt before. I think it's getting worse, he added reproachfully. At first, just the part in my mouth turned to chocolate. But when I nibbled the end of my pencil, the whole pencil chained. Pooh, said Susan, and the others hooted with glee. Maybe I'll get sick and die, John warned. Maybe I'll turn to chocolate myself. Then you'll be sorry. I don't believe one word about the chocolate, Susan said. And if it is true, you'd be glad, because all you ever like eating is chocolate. If you don't believe me, John retorted. <clears throat> Just you give me that skipping rope and I'll prove it. The girls looked questioningly at each other for an instant, but as they hesitated, the bell rang and it was time to go back to the classroom. The rest of the morning passed slowly for John. He was afraid that his mother was going to be cross about the missing gloves. She might not accept the excuse that he had eaten them. He regretted his messed up arithmetic test. He was sad about Susan's anger and disbelief, and he was getting terribly thirsty. Once during geography and once during art, he was excused to get a drink of water. Both times, however, he swallowed nothing but sweet chocolate. His mouth was getting stickier and sweeter and drier by the minute. Chapter 7, in which there's a picture of like a spoon and a fork and a glass of water maybe and then something else to drink. All right, boys and girls, Mrs. Plimsoll said. It is almost time for lunch. Clear up your things. Paint pots securely closed, brushes washed, painting, paintings unpinned and laid out to dry. Drawing boards stacked against the wall. Ah, there's the bell. Front row first, Timothy leading, then
Then Robin in a single file go. John alone walks slowly in the throng hurrying in the throng hurrying along the corridors to the school cafeteria. The school was proud of the cafeteria and the food served in it. The room was spacious and bright with windows all the way along one side overlooking the playground and the playing fields beyond. The opposite side was wholly taken up by the shiny silver service counter. Several boys and girls were already settled at the tables by the time John took his place in line. Enviously, John noticed a boy at the nearby table. Enviously, John noticed a boy at a nearby table stuck suck at straws dipped in a milk bottle that was dull with frost. John could imagine the refreshing taste of cold creamy milk. At another table, a group of girls were eating fat red cherries. John could almost feel the firm fruit on his tongue and the pleasure of biting through the tart, juicy pulp. The cherries must taste good. They must be thirst quenching. John, unhappily, took a tray from the pile and slid it along the rails in front of the top of the counter. He put a paper napkin, a glass, and a gleaming spoon, a knife, and a fork on the tray. It seemed hardly worth the while, but he felt that he might as well try the food and drink. Perhaps if I eat a different way, without letting anything touch my lips, he muttered, my lunch won't all change to chocolate. He was not very hopeful. What? asked the boy standing next to him. Nothing, John said. I thought I heard you say something about chocolate, the boy said. I hope this is the day for chocolate cream pie, he added. That'd be super. On chocolate cream pie days of the past, John had been known to skip the main course so that he might spend all his lunch money on dessert. The thought of four pieces of chocolate cream pie now suddenly made his stomach feel as though he were on a roller coaster, an uneasy, flibberty jibberty sensation. John sh shuddered. Okay, he commented, wrinkling up his nose. The other boy shrugged his shoulders and started to choose his meal. John took a plate of cold chicken and ham, potato chips, and a crisp, moist lettuce and tomato salad. The white of the chicken, the pink of the ham, the gold of the potatoes, the pale green of the lettuce, and the red of the tomato looked delicious. He also took half a pint of milk, a thick crusted whole wheat roll, and a cool pat of butter, a tumbler of water with ice cubes clinking against the glass, and a dish of fresh fruit, slices of orange and grapefruit, and bananas and grapes. John's tray was loaded with the sort of meal his mother was always trying to persuade him to eat. Until today, John had always thought it was pretty dull to eat sensible things when there was sweeter food and drink to be had. Today, however, the sensible things looked most appetizing and his mouth began to water in its new sticky way. John paid for the lunch with his money his mother had given him and went to an empty table and sat down. <clears throat> His fingers trembling slightly with eagerness, he cut a slice of lettuce. He cut a slice of lettuce. His fork went through the leaves with a promising crunch. He stuck the prongs of the fork into a mouth-sized piece of lettuce and carefully inserted it into his mouth. The lettuce didn't touch his wide-stretched lips. John's teeth came together in crisp layers of sweet chocolate. He took a small piece of potato chip, tilted it back at tilted back his head until he was looking straight up at the ceiling and dropped the morsel straight down into his throat. He felt it go down, a sharp fragment of sweet chocolate. He tried the milk, the ice water, the fruit. Every solid and liquid that he sampled was transformed as soon as it entered his mouth. Then he became aware of a shocking novelty that he hadn't noticed at breakfast. At the rim of each glass, there was a small semicircle of opaque brown. The bowl of his the bowl of his spoon and the prongs of his fork had become brown. As John watched horrified, the areas of magic chocolate slowly spread until at last the glasses and the cutlery were all solid chocolate. The trouble was unquestionable was unquestionable unquestionably growing worse. John's scalp tightened with fear. What am I going to do? He asked himself miserably. Oh dear, oh dear, what is going to happen to me? Leaving his tray of chocolate food and drink and utensils, John stumbled away from the cafeteria and out to the playground. <laughs>